Hey, I just want to let you know that this video is part of a larger course called Operating Systems 101 on CyberTrainingPro.com. So if you enjoy the content, you want to see the rest of the course, or you want to see other courses that we have or our career services, make sure to check out CyberTrainingPro.com. I'll leave a link in the description so you can check it out. All right, let's get started. Not everything that you do in the Windows operating system while working in IT or cybersecurity is going to be with the graphical user interface or the GUI. Sometimes we have to use a command line, so it's important that you have an understanding of certain things. If you've ever seen a movie about hackers or watched them in real life, they rarely use the graphical user interface, which we call the GUI like a normal user would. If you aren't familiar with the term GUI, it's the visual display that you see with all the menus, the images, and the text on the screen. Both attackers and defenders need to make use of the command line interface, which we also call the CLI or the command shell. The CLI is great for performing tasks quickly and even scripting out several commands to run as fast as the computer can run them. Keep in mind that the CLI is significantly faster than using the GUI if you use it right. If you need to access the CLI on a Windows system, there's a few different ways that you can do it. The first way is to go to the start menu and type command prompt. And it's gonna be this first option here and you can just open that up and that will give you access to the CLI. The other way is if you go to start and you go to run, type cmd.exe. Same thing, this will show you the command line. The third way that you can do this is going to the start menu and opening up PowerShell. So Windows has tied a lot of these legacy kind of things or these older, more traditional things into PowerShell. So just like with the command line and command prompt, you can do this in PowerShell as well. Okay, now that we have the command line open, let's talk about some of the popular commands that exist. The first command we're gonna talk about is the dir command, and this is very useful if you wanna list files or folders on a system. The first command that we're gonna use is going to list all the files within the root directory or the top level of the file system. The second command is gonna list any files or folders within a subfolder of your current location. You can also give it a specific path if you want to. So we're gonna do dir and then desktop for the desktop folder, and that's gonna show everything inside of that folder. The next command is gonna list files and folders of everything up one level in the file system from where you're at. As you can see, the current location was in the local admin directory, and so this command looked in C users which is one level up. The next command is gonna show the files or folders on a different drive other than the C drive. You can see here that I provided the D drive and that listed out all the files and folders on that drive. The next command is only gonna list files with a .exe extension, which is also known as an executable file. As you can see here, it listed the setup.exe file. And if we just do a regular dir, we're gonna see there's actually a whole lot of other stuff on here. The next command is gonna show any hidden files or folders. So we're gonna use this command, and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because it is going to take up a little bit more space on the screen here. So you can see these ntuser.dat and some other files that we don't normally see if we just do a regular dir command in here. The next command is going to show any alternate data streams that exist in that location. As you can see, we don't have any, but it will show other stuff in here as well. And the final command is going to show you all possible commands that you can use with dir. On the screen is a list of the commands that we just went over. The change directory command, or cd, is extremely common if you want to change to a location on the file system. If we start out by just typing cd, this is going to print our location where we are in the file system. We can also type chdir, and that will do the same thing. If we want to change to another drive on the system, there's typically a few different ways that we can do it. A lot of times on older systems especially, we can use the cd command and then type in the drive and then colon, and that would change to that drive. On this Windows 11 installation, it's not actually doing that, so what we can do is actually just type the drive letter, type colon, and then hit return. And now we're in the D drive. If we want to change to the root directory, which is the top level directory on a file system, we can type CD, and then we can type slash, and that will take us to the C drive. 
We can also use a similar command to go to a specific folder. So for instance, if we want to go to the users folder, we can type cd c slash users like we were in before, and then we can hit return, and that will put us into that specific folder. You do not have to be in any folder associated with where you want to go. It could be a completely different directory than you're in. If we want to change to the parent directory, which is one directory level up, we can type cd and then dot dot and then hit return. And as you can see, we went from C users to now just the C drive. Let's talk about folders with spaces in the name. So if I type dir so we can list the folders out, you can see we have this saved games folder with the space in here. So if I type cd and then use quotations and I type saved games, and then I put the closing quotation marks on there, and then I hit return, that will put us into that folder. If we go back up one level and we type CD saved games, Windows 11 has gotten kind of smart, so it actually will put us into that folder, but previous versions of Windows might not do that. So you wanna make sure that you are using the quotation marks on the folders. We can also use the wildcard with the CD command. So if we type CD, saved, and then we put an asterisk or the wildcard, that will put us into the saved games folder. It's anything that starts with the word saved. So keep that in mind if you have a lot of folders that start with saved or they start with the same thing and you're using the wildcard. On the screen is the list of commands that we were just working with. Being able to create folders, remove folders, and changing the location of files might seem very basic, but it's really important. If you wanna make a folder on a Windows system, there's two different ways that you can do it. First, you can type MD and then the folder name, and then that will create test one in this situation. The other way is you can use the MKDIR and then type your folder name. So as you can see, they both worked. They both created folders. So now we have two different folders in here. We have test one and test two. If we wanna remove these, we can do it two different ways. First, we can use the RD command and provide the directory. And now we only have test two in here. The other way is we can use the RMDIR command and give the folder name. And now we can see that both of those folders are deleted with both of those commands. So now I've created a test.txt file and then we have a test1 folder here. So now we're gonna move this file into the test1 directory. So we're gonna use the move command and then we're gonna provide the file name, so test.txt, and then we're gonna provide the directory, so test1. Now if we do the dir command, we can see that it has been moved. If we go into the test1 folder, we will see that that test.txt file is in here. Now, if we wanna move it to the parent directory, so up one level, we can use the move command again, and we'll give the file name of test.txt, and then we'll type dot dot, and that will move it to the parent directory. If we do a dir command, we can see that that is no longer in the test1 folder. If we change directories to the parent directory, and we do a dir command again, we can see that the test.txt file is back in the parent directory. On the screen, we have the commands that we just covered if you want a summary of those commands. Now let's talk about file management. If we go ahead and use the dir command, we can see that we have a few different files that are in this location. If we want to remove one of them, we can type the del command and then give the file name of test.txt. Now if we do the dir command again, we can see that test.txt was removed from the system. If we want to copy a file, we can type the copy command and then give the file name, so test2.txt, and we're going to name this test3.txt. If we do a dir command again, we'll see we have test2.txt and an exact copy called test3.txt. If we want to rename a file, we can use the ren command, give the file name, so test3.txt. We're going to rename this test4.txt. If we do a dir command again, we'll see we have a test2.txt and a test4.txt. If we want to view a text file, we can type type and then the file name, so test4.txt, and that gives us the contents of that file. If we open this up with Notepad, we'll see that that is indeed the text that is in that file. So if we do a dir command real quick, we can see we have two files. We have a test2.txt and a test4.txt. Now let's hide one of these files. So if we use the attrib command, we give the file name, so we'll do test4.txt, and then plus h. Now if we do a dir command again, 
we'll see that we do not see that test4.txt file anymore. If we want to list the hidden files, we can do a dir slash a and then colon h, and that will list the hidden file, the test4.txt. Again, otherwise, if we do a regular dir, it's only going to list the unhidden files or the visible files. If we want to unhide that file, we can use the attrib, the file name, so test4.txt, and then minus h. Now, if we do a dir command again, we'll see that we have test2.txt and test4.txt. Here's a list of the commands that we just went over. So what if you want to list currently running processes on a system? This is useful if we want to find malicious processes on our system, and for this, we can use the task list command. On our system, if we type task list, this will list all the processes that are currently running on our system. Now we're gonna open up Notepad. So now we have a running instance of Notepad. So if we go back to our command prompt window here and we type task list, pipe, find str, and in quotation marks, we're gonna type notepad.exe and hit return. This will give us the process ID of that current running instance. Now, if we wanna kill this process, we can type task kill slash PID, and then we'll enter in the process ID of 3692. You can see that killed our process. Now let's open up Notepad again. Let's go back to our command prompt window. Let's type task list, again pipe, find str, notepad.exe. This will open it up under a different process ID, so keep that in mind. If we type task kill slash im, and then notepad.exe, that will also kill our notepad instance. On the screen is the commands that we just ran. Okay, now let's start talking about networking commands on the Windows operating system. We'll begin with ipconfig, which shows network configurations of the local system. This includes things like the IP address information about your network interface card. If we type ipconfig on our system, this is gonna show us the IP information that we need. If we type ipconfig slash all, this is gonna show us more detailed networking information about our system. On the screen is a quick summary of the commands that we just ran. The next common network command is netstat, which shows network connection information. If we just type netstat, you can see what that shows. So that just shows different connections that are going on on this system. If we type netstat-n, that's going to show us IP information. If we type netstat-a, that's going to show us listening ports on our system. So these are ports that are waiting for connections with other systems. If we type netstat-o, this is gonna show us process ID information related to the connections on our system. And if we type netstat-r, this is gonna show us the routing table for our system. All of these commands are particularly useful if you see that your systems are communicating with malicious servers or they have malicious routes for traffic that are configured. On the screen is a summary of the commands that we just ran. Ping is another really common command to verify system connectivity. So basically, can you communicate with a specific system? So an example command would be with the IP address or the domain name. So we can type ping 8.8.8.8 and that is a Google server. If we hit return, that's going to try to communicate with that system. We can also type ping google.com, which is the domain name, and that will do the same thing. As you can see, it does use a different IP address depending on where you're trying to communicate with it, how load balancing and all of those things are set up for Google. Keep in mind that ping uses the ICMP protocol or internet control message protocol to communicate. It's not uncommon to block this type of traffic on systems, because it's not really essential traffic that's needed for systems to work, and it could be a security concern. By default, the Windows firewall typically is gonna block this type of traffic too. Traceroute or TraceRT is another useful command that displays the path the traffic is gonna take to reach its destination and any type of latency. For example, we can type TraceRT and then the 8.8.8.8 IP address, and that will show us the path that it's going to take. A lot of times when firewalls or devices are blocking this type of traffic or they're just not providing this information, you'll see things like this where there's asterisks and request timed out. That's totally normal. We can also type trace RT and then provide the domain name. So if we type google.com, we'll do the same thing. Again, just like with the last command, we do start seeing some of these asterisks and request timed out. Again, totally normal. In order for traceroute to function, it does require intermediate systems, so in between systems, to send ICMP time exceeded packets. From a security standpoint, traceroute is a very valuable command. 
Think about this. If you can see that your traffic is being routed through a foreign nation on the other side of the world, that's probably something you're gonna to wanna to look into. I just wanna do a few quick exercises with these commands to make sure that you're familiar and you feel comfortable with them. I highly encourage you to do these commands along with me. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna to change to the root directory of the system. And as you can see, now we are in the C drive here. Now we're gonna to change to our user profile. So we're gonna type CD and then percent user profile percent. As you can see, we are the local admin user and now we are in our profile. Now we're gonna to change to the OS 101 folder and we're gonna create a directory called MySpace. So we're typing MKDIR and this is gonna be two words, so we have to use the quotation marks. So MySpace and then hit return. Now if we do a dir, we can see that MySpace is created. Now if we wanna change into that directory, we can type CD and then quotations. We're gonna type my and then I'm gonna hit tab and that is a tab completion, so that will actually fill in the rest of what we're trying to type. And we'll hit return. Now we're gonna create a directory called hide me, so we're gonna type md and hide me. If we do a dir, we'll see that that directory is created. Now we're gonna hide that directory. So we're gonna use the attrib, hide me directory, and plus h. If we do dir again, we'll see that that directory no longer exists. If we type dir and then slash a colon h, we will see that that directory does show up when we're looking for hidden directories or hidden files. Now we're gonna unhide that folder, so we're gonna use the attrib hide me dash h. And we can see that that directory is now back there. So we're gonna rename that using the ren command, hide me, and we're gonna rename it to short. If we do a dir, we'll see that that is now called short instead of hide me. Now we're gonna open notepad. We're gonna go back to our command line window here and we're gonna type task list, find str, and then notepad.exe. So now we have our PID and our executable, and we're gonna kill that executable. So we're gonna use the task kill, the PID, or you can use the slash im command, whichever one you wanna use. And we're gonna type 4636 if you're using the kill for the PID. If you're using the slash im, then of course you'd use the executable name. And that killed the notepad instance. Now we're gonna find our IP address on our system with the ipconfig command, and we'll see that our IP address is 192.168.163.128. Just for good measure, we're gonna type netstat to see our network connections that exist on our system. That's it for this video. I hope you learned a lot, and I'll see you in the next one.